When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Happy holidays. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money. I'm your host, Shauna Game, and we did it. We are on day 12 of 12 days of holiday episodes. I hope you have enjoyed this series. Hopefully you have listened to some of these episodes, maybe sent some of them to some of your friends or some people who you think, you know what, they need to listen to this episode. We are rounding out the new year with another one of my personal favorites, Five Ways to Build Good Money Habits with Eric Roberge. And the New Year's, right? It's right around the corner. You might be thinking about intentions and habits and goals and all of these things that you just really want to breathe into life. And I think one of the most important things when we talk about money is habits. It's small daily action steps. It is also thinking about your thoughts around money and really working through all of that day in and day out. Instead of these big lofty goals, let's start thinking about small micro goals that we can take every single day. So I hope you enjoy this episode and I will see you right back here in a brand new year on January 1st. All right, let's start talking. It's, it's paying attention. It's, it's being consistent with things and knowing that there are times when just like with your job or with your family, um, money is hard. It's okay. It's, it's hard. And pushing through those hard times in order to get to the other side to have that ease is really important. And so just because you feel stress around your finances doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. You might actually be doing something right. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money Podcast. I'm your host, Shauna Game. There's no judgment, no dumb questions, just smart conversations about you and your money. So come on in and grab a seat. Everyone is welcome here. You know, good money habits, they don't just magically happen. You aren't born with these stellar skills to make smart money choices and do all the quote unquote right things to set you up to achieve your goals. If you were, well, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But building good money habits, it takes a bit of, I don't know, elbow grease, a few wobbles here and there, and just a desire to keep going no matter what. But I know you've got what it takes. Eric Roberge, CFP and founder of Beyond Your Hammock, a Boston-based fee-only financial planning firm, is committed to helping you build good money habits so you can just get more from your money while still enjoying what you love to do in life. I don't know, it sounds pretty good to me. So it's summertime. I don't want you to work too hard, but that's why I love Eric's advice. Figure out the most important thing you're trying to do with your money and just start there. 
Enjoy the journey and celebrate the progress. Okay, that really means like, don't make all the things more difficult than they need to be around money. So here we go. Let's dive in and start talking about Eric's five ways to build good money habits. I love when I have a fellow CFP on because we kind of get to nerd out and and talk about money and talk about, you know, how how money impacts people because we've we've seen it. We've sat across from people. And, you know, what we're talking about today is something that I haven't talked about a lot on the show, actually, which is kind of surprising to me. But I think it's a real sort of underestimated topic when we think about how do you build wealth and how do you you know, gain financial freedom and this idea of money habits and, and, you know, the kind of the ways we get in in the way, I think, of uh, good money habits, you know, what do they look like? So we're going to dissect it all, you know, to kind of get us started off, uh, you know, what, what ways do we kind of sabotage our money habits? Like what gets in there and like messes up things that, you know, are, are there, you know, to try and get us to our money goals? Well, emotions, emotions have a big, uh, they're a big factor in money, right? Whether you, whether you have good emotions about money or bad emotions about money, they're there. And so if you don't pay attention and you let your emotions drive the way about your money decisions, that's when trouble can arise. I just think about like, oh, when you got upset the last time and you did something, you're like, I wish I didn't do that, but I was upset. Same deal with money. I wish I didn't spend that money. I wish I did something different. It just it just tends to cloud the the proper decision making. I mean, this is like the million dollar like crystal ball question, right? But if emotions and I, I totally agree with you, like our emotions and and um gosh, like so many different factors, how we how we were raised, how our parents talked about money, um, even you know, ancestral kind of like what's been passed down to us about money, like it's all just in there kind of swimming around. And for most of us, it's kind of in the in the background. Like we don't really think about our emotions playing that big of a role. Um, you know, how do we begin to kind of like untangle that all and like figure out what the emotions are and and what is getting in the way? Well, I think it's it's just like I mean, I am not a psychologist or psychiatrist in any way, but like thinking about just like you look back and say, why am I a certain way? Why do I believe a certain thing? Why do I act a certain way in these situations? And it really is. When you were five years old, things happened and you determined that that's the way things were. So just exploring how your parents think about money and how they were raised and asking questions about how money was when you were younger can really help you understand why you feel certain way, a certain way now. So you don't have to be an expert, but you just explore and be curious about your history and your upbringing. I think that's a big factor in it. Is there anything that you can kind of spot from your own upbringing that you're like, oh, okay, that plays into into how I deal with money and whether it's good or not good? Like, I think the first step is just having awareness. So I'm always like really interested in uh, people's stories. Yeah, there there are two things that come to mind when someone's asked me that question. The first one, I don't actually know why it always shows up. It is my mother and I. I was probably four years old, and my mother's car broke down on uh, not a highway, but like a, a, a strip mall kind of throughway, right? A lot of strip malls. And we got stuck in the middle of the, of, the, of the road and there was a traffic jam behind us. And we had to go into a pizza shop and ask questions or uh, make a call to get help. And that sticks with me so much. And what I, what I think it has done is to drive me to always buy quality things and take care of my stuff Mm -hmm. to make sure that things don't break down at the inopportune time. And I don't know if that's right or not, but that's just, that's just one of those things that I'm applying it to. Interesting. That's really fascinating. You know, I grew up with like an interesting dynamic. I had a dad who kind of worked all the time. And so I, I got kind of the message that you know, you basically have to be like a workaholic to, to build wealth and, and, and to have a good life. But then I had a mom on kind of the flip side of that, who would literally give her last dollar, you know, to anybody who needed it. And I just remember as a, as a kid kind of thinking, well, well, which way is it? Like, how am I actually supposed to 
feel about it, you know, and it wasn't until I was in, you know, my 20s, kind of early 30s, I was like, oh, okay, I see how both of these things like show up in my own relationship with money and how I handle things or don't handle them. And, um, you know, it was like a real sort of like cathartic experience for me to, to, to figure that out. And then, you know, I started when I was a practicing CFP, I started asking other people these questions. And it's really interesting, like to watch people kind of have these aha moments about, oh, like, maybe that's why I do this, or maybe that's why I don't do this. And I think that's just one part of kind of the traditional, I don't know, money world that is is kind of left out in these conversations that I think like really needs to be there. Yeah. No, it's important. I mean, just the fact that that's why I do this, right? Just knowing that even if it's not right, like you you can you can ground yourself in a reason for why you're doing a certain thing. And you can say, you know what? I can do something different. That's that's what I've been doing, but I can now do something different, which opens up an entire new world for you to to move forward and use your money in a different way if that way of being is not helping you so far. I like that. I like that we can change. So let's go back to this idea of of a money habit. You know, Eric, what does I mean, what does a money habit look like? Like what does a, a good habit consist of and um, you know, how do we start kind of ushering in some of those good money habits? Well, one of the things that I believe from myself is that I should be a good steward of my money right? and be responsible in using it. And so that really ties into how I think about money in that it is a, it's a tool and it can be used for good or bad, but it should be taken care of and, and you should respect it, right? So the first thing to do when you're trying to do that, in my mind, is to pay attention to how you use it. If, if you don't know where your money is going, then I would say that you're not being necessarily responsible and you're not paying attention to how you're using it. So you should probably figure out what you spend your money on. Just ground yourself in that. It's not a right or wrong thing. You don't have to blame yourself for doing certain things. Just know what it is. And that allows you to take control over your finances. Yeah, this may seem like a really obvious question. Um, but for somebody listening, how do I get past the fear part? If, if, I'm, if I'm listening now and I'm feeling this, how do I get past the fear part of knowing exactly where I spend my money. Like, because I feel like so many people, you know, like I have a general idea, right? But there's still somewhat this like distance approach to really knowing where you're spending your money. Like, how do you get over that kind of hurdle? And what's the benefit of of really knowing where you're spending your money? Yeah. Well, I mean, just asking yourself the question, why am I afraid? Like, what is it that I am so afraid of? When looking at my finances, would really would really be a helpful piece to that, because once you can understand why you're afraid, at least you can maybe pay more attention to that, and then give yourself a break. Because this isn't about blaming yourself; it's about getting awareness, and with awareness comes control going forward. Again, it's you can change anything moving forward; it doesn't matter what happened in the past. And so, you look at where it went. And that does give, I answer your question, that gives you the control and you can say, all right, well, most of my money goes toward eating out. Why do I spend so much money on eating out? And just ask why, 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 and get to this level of, okay, well, I love, I'm making this up, but I love to be social. And when I go out, I am inviting friends and we have a good time. Okay. Well, if you're spending that much money and you can still save what you need to save for in other areas. Maybe it's fine. You don't change anything. But if you're saying, I can't save a dollar and I have credit cards, bills that are piling up, well, maybe you should back off there. Could you do something different? Could you invite people over your house? Could you have uh, an appetizer instead of a full dinner? Like just ways to figure out how to still get that social interaction that you're looking for in that in that example, but not spend so much money doing so. Yeah, I've shared this uh, story a few times, I think, on the podcast. And every time I do, I always get listeners writing and saying like, no way, this doesn't happen. But I'm I'm sure you have, you have stories like this too. I was working with a couple many years ago and they wanted to buy a house and they could not figure out, like we make good money. Like how can we not save money for the down payment? And, um, you know, so they hired me to kind of figure out what was going on. And of course, you know, the first question I was like, okay, let me see, you know, like where you're spending your money. And so they handled, handed me this like crumpled up budget. And I was like, 
okay, like, when was the last time you actually updated this? So like, updated it? Why would you update it? Like, okay, well, all right, all right, we'll, we'll back up from there, you know? So I scrubbed through their, their bank statements and, you know, they had thought that they were spending like $300, $400 eating out every month. They'd love to go out and kind of treat their friends. And, you know, when I looked at the last like three months bank statements, what they were really spending was like close to $3,000 a month. And, you know, when I came to them and showed them the numbers, they were just in complete denial. Like, how could this be happening? We, we thought we were spending, you know, a much lower number. And I think it, I'm sure you have a million stories like this too. I'm curious if any, any kind of come to mind, but it's, it's just so interesting how, you know, your brain, you can convince yourself of anything. You can convince yourself like, oh, I'm only spending X amount of dollars. But when you look at the numbers, like the, the, the actual truth of it, you know, it tell it, it tells the actual story. And so of course, you know, they were able to, to bring in some good money habits, make some changes. And, you know, in nine months, they were able to have enough money to, to save to buy the house, you know, something that like had eluded them for years. And I, I just think it's so interesting that um, really grows to show like how we can convince ourselves of different things around money and, and what you're saying, like actually knowing the numbers. I mean, that's like the critical point. Yeah, no, that's so true. And and even to your point, right, there was there was a reason why they wanted to make the shift. And I think that's key because if if you don't have a really valid reason why you believe you need to change, you're not going to change. And so in this case, it was we want to buy this maybe more expensive house or just a house in, in general, and therefore we need to change because we say we want to buy the house and that house is more important than the restaurant spending. Right? So just understanding your that's another piece to it, right? Understanding your values and what really drives you and what you believe and, and what makes you feel good because you've, you know, you've spent on things that are touching on those values. How do you get a person like to that, to that point or to figure out kind of the depth of, of that? Why, you know, cause they, they come to you for, you know, give me air, give me your like financial guidance, like help me figure out how to reach these goals. And, you know, you can put whatever on a, on a piece of paper, but like the actual, you know, motivating factor to get people to create change and to, you know, build these good money habits. Like, how do you figure out that piece with someone? It's, it's an ongoing process, right? There's, there's not a, a one conversation and everything is changed. And uh, we strongly believe that a financial plan is not a one-time event because of that. It's an ever-evolving process, not a document that tells you what to do next because your life will change, right? Your life is different than it was five years ago. You believe different things. You have different goals. It's going to change again in the next five years. So that's, that's really important. So we, we initially start to answer your question. We, we initially start to say, what are your goals? Right. And a lot of times people will throw things out like, well, we just had a baby. So we have childcare. We had to pay for, and then we're going to get a bigger house because we're going to have a second child. And then we want to have some career flexibility because we don't want to work all the time and we want to pay for college. So that all gets dumped out there, right? And we see if that can work. And if it doesn't work, I think that's the first aha moment. Like, okay, we want all these things, but we can't do them all with the way we're going about things right now. We need to change. Yeah. I mean, I think it's like so interesting to me. It's like one of the focuses really of the show is kind of that, that human dynamic um, or that human, I don't know, that human, humanness, I guess, that we all bring to, to money and, you know, helping people like really understand that for themselves and that we're all different and that there isn't, you know, necessarily like one linear um, plan for everybody because we all have different goals and needs and things that, that, that we really like and things that motivate us and things that don't. And so to me, it's just always fascinating to you know, help like, um, I don't know, uncover that for, for someone and help them be able to figure out, you know, like, oh, this is why, you know, this is why this is really important to me. Like, this is what it will do, you know, for my, for my family or how it will change my life or how it will make me feel. And I think that's kind of the exciting piece about money. Um, I just want to go back a little bit to, to the habits and, you know, for somebody listening, um, who maybe ha hasn't had an experience with a financial planner, what do you think are some of the kind of core um, money habits that you think maybe we, we all should, we should all try to embody? 
Well, I mean, I think the, I mean, we talked about one of them, right? That's just getting clear on where your money's going. Um, but I think an overlay to that is really getting clear on what you want. And that that's really important to understand and it helps to drive change is what do you actually want? And then start to align your spending and your cash flow and your savings to those things. Um, and and really understanding too your your values. And we talked about goals, but understand goals and values can be different. I think big picture values and how you what you believe in, how you want to live your life and how you want to be for your family. And these things are so important because they will help guide how you should be with your finances. It's again, it's the, it's the bigger reasoning that's going to influence what you need to do next that's going to help you do those things. Not just because an advisor says, you know what, you really should have a budget and you really only need to, you can only spend this much money on this category. I am not that advisor. I think cash flow management is important, but I am not going to nickel and dime the person so that they feel like they are in this jail cell and can't spend the money on what they want to spend it on. It's everything in moderation, but align it with your values. So I don't think I answered the, the question, but I just, it always goes back to that. Like, what is the core? What do I want for me and my family? And then everything goes from there. What would be, give me an example of like, what would be a, a money value? Well, it's not necessarily a money value. It, it's a life value. And then you apply it to your finances. So one of, one of my, um, my wife and I have come up with values. And one of the values that we have is togetherness. And so how can we manage our finances in a way that allows for togetherness? That could be applied to housing, right? We could have a place that allows for us to invite family over to stay the night or at least to enjoy an afternoon on a holiday or whatever. So there's a reason why we want a certain type of house in a certain location to access that togetherness. Um, it also could be, again, like going back to the restaurants, right? Going to dinner to enjoy togetherness with friends. Right? So that, that is one for us that's, that's big. And just another example is growth. So growth, growth of assets helps for choice, but growth of mind in, in learning and education, like that is part of our value system too. So if we spend money on an activity that allows us to learn something that is going to feel better than spending money on an activity that doesn't. Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T A L K A N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash T O S for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. 
but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. I like that. I like that idea of of values. Again, I think something that we don't normally think about doing or we don't normally think about like sitting down and, you know, especially in a relationship, how do we fuse together uh, in a partnership, you know, two different maybe money values or two different ways of, of going after or cultivating, I should say, good money habits. How do we kind of bring like those two forces together? Yeah. Well, you just hit on something that is really important in that just because we're talking about, I mean, couples here, right? Like, so couples together, family and and managing money together. And so when you come into a relationship, you don't necessarily have the exact same value structure in order of priorities as your spouse or your significant other. And, and therefore, it's really important to have the freedom to design your own five values that are different from your spouse's five values mm. and then come together to discuss them and see what are, is similar and what is different. But then there's this other evolution of it to make a list of five values that you are creating for your family. And they don't have to be the same as your individual's but they should rhyme with those and they should join you together in this new list of values. And, and that allows you, just that converse, that process allows you to understand what makes you tick, what makes your significant other tick as well. And then you can start to build on that, to design a financial plan. Again, coming from life to money, not using money and building your life around that. And what if you have um, like specific money goals that you really want to achieve, but you know, for whatever reason, you just can't seem to kind of like get over the whole hurdle. You know, I know for a lot of people, it's it's paying off debt or paying off student loans. Um, you know, I, I hear from a lot of listeners who want to start investing, but maybe they're afraid of of investing or they're they're just not sure. You know, they're afraid of like waking up one day and like all their money is lost. You know, maybe they they saw that happen in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, with a parent or a sibling or something like that. How do you, how do you kind of get over those hurdles when you have money goals, but it's it's like it's just for whatever reason kind of not coming together? Is does that come back to a money habit that maybe you need to build, or is there maybe something else at play there? Well, it takes it takes time to build any habit, right? If you if you haven't worked out in three years, going back to the gym is going to be a really big uphill battle. Right? If if you want to cut back on the food you eat. Um, and you've built the habit of eating certain things, it's going to take a mindset and a really a support system to help you change those habits. So if you're finding it's difficult to change habits that are not working for you in your finances, just like any other area, you should get a coach. You should get someone else that's an objective third party that can help you stick to um, a plan. And if it, you don't, not everybody needs that, but if you find that that is something that you're not moving forward with, you should probably look for outside resource to help an expert to guide you through that process to hold you accountable to making the changes that you've already said to yourself you want to make because you don't have to do it on your own and you don't, you're not weak because you can't. It's just it's a challenging thing to change habits. 
It, that is definitely an understatement for sure. <laughs> if anybody listening has ever tried to change a habit, I, I know I've tried to change many habits over the years and it is definitely like an uphill battle. And, you know, I think specifically with money, because it can be this very like charged you know, taboo topic. It's something that we we don't, you know, like to talk about with really anybody. Uh, a lot of times we don't talk about it with our partner. We don't want to face it ourselves. And so, you know, when we kind of come up against that idea of, of changing a, a habit, um, gosh, it can feel like kind of all the forces are are against you. You know, I always tell people like, just one, like one little baby step every day, like one little thing uh, in that positive direction, um, you know, helps you make make progress. And and I think I don't know I don't know about you, Eric, but like I think it also does something you know to our brain when we can see like just a little bit of progress. Like we start to feel really motivated. I was wondering, like you know, how do you see that that play out with with clients? Like when they start, you know, just taking little steps towards towards whatever that changing a habit towards a goal, whatever it might be. Yeah, no, that's a really important thing, making progress, right? It's 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 not necessarily achieving the goal or getting to the destination that provides the happiness. It's making progress along the way. And I think Tony Robbins said something similar where where it's just like it's it's the journey. It's enjoying the journey that's really the driving force behind the happiness. It's not getting to the goal. And so helping people enjoy the journey and see their progress is really important, whether it's paying down debt. Or saving money and seeing that their assets are growing, you show them where they were. And I'm sure that they're not remembering exactly where they were. Because if you ask somebody like, where were you financially five years ago? They're going to say something. It's probably wrong, right? They need to know that. <laughs> so we can show them here is the progress on paper that you made. Again, your debt comes down or your assets are going up. Look what you did. I right? didn't feel like you were doing anything, but you were taking baby steps. And those actions, consistent actions over time, here are the results. And I think that brings some motivation to the next steps. I want to talk about a little bit about the the name of your company, uh, Beyond the Hammock. I think it's like, it, it's it's so great because I was reading on your website and you talked about this idea of, you know, wanting to inspire people to kind of think beyond what they think is possible, but also balancing that with ease in life. And I, I think you you talked about this early on when you talked about, you know, the values that you share with your wife, you know, how can we all bring in a little of the, of that essence of looking beyond what we think is possible, but also finding kind of this place of, of ease with our money so that we're just not so just stressed out all the time? That's a really good question. And it's, it probably is an entire podcast in itself to try to figure that out. But I think for me, it's, it's, it's paying attention. It's, it's being consistent with things and knowing that there are times when just like with your job or with your family, um, money is hard. It's okay. It's, it's hard. And pushing through those hard times in order to get to the other side, to have that ease is really important. And so just because you feel stress around your finances doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. You might actually be doing something right. You're paying attention. If you don't have any stress about your money and you're not doing things right, well, then you're, you're over in the deep end, right? Like there's stress there. It means you're at least aware. And then when you, when you, once you experience the ease that it can have, like saving a bunch, we, my wife and I are really good savers. And we know that saving a bunch of money does two things for us. One, if expenses increase on an annual basis, we have some buffer and we just save less, right? We don't have to change our budget. We just have a cushion that allows us to save less and continue our lifestyle. Um, and also if we're saving, the second piece to this is we're going to have more money in the future to be able to live a flexible life. And so the idea that saving money allows us to have a flexible life throughout time is more important than maybe spending more now and feeling like if we don't, we have a restricted life. And so that the ease that comes with that feeling of like, oh, I'm making smart decisions here and it can be tough, but then the next day, maybe it's not. And being able to enjoy the fruits of your labor and really be present when you have the time to be present is, I think that's the, the essence of it, right? the, the, the presence that good money management allows you because you can 
put money off to the side and just enjoy the moment because you know you've done the hard work to get there. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. Yeah, I, I like that idea of being in the present. That's definitely something that... um I feel like it's a lifelong goal for me (laughs) to really like live that on a daily basis. I'm either, uh, what is it? Um, Anxiety is looking into the future or fear is looking into the past. And I'm usually like oscillating between one of those two things. And, you know, certainly when, when I moved to the East Coast a couple of years ago, like my one goal was, you know, I, I want to find more ease. And I think that means I've got to be more present and you know not so like fixated on on either of those things but i know you know when it comes to to money for for so many people listening it's it's really hard you know people can be you know really kind of stuck in the cycle of paycheck to paycheck and um you know can really be just just nervous about, about kind of everything right now you know we've got we've got high inflation you know people being laid off from their jobs we've got you know higher interest rates and there's there's just kind of a you know a lot going on, and I think that it's it's sometimes really hard to kind of just ground into to present. But you know you're in the you're in the money world every day, and and helping people, you know, with kind of all of these things swirling around us, and this idea of wanting to be more present. You know, what are the things kind of like externally in the money world that we need to pay attention to, and what are some of the things that maybe we can just kind of like let go? That's a that's a really good point. In in the because the, the external things are typically what takes us away from being present because it puts us into the state of anxiety. And it's it's those things that we have no control over that really get us anxious. But if you think about it, if we have no control over this thing and we're trying to control it and that's causing anxiety, maybe we should we should step back and say, listen, like of all the things that are going on right now, what are the things that I can control? I can't control the war in Ukraine. I can help support one side or the other, but I can't control the war itself. I can't control inflation, but what can I control? I can control my spending, right? I can, I can keep my spending in a way that allows me to have the flexibility, right? When expenses go up, part of expenses going up might be that inflation is happening. And so if I've built a budget that allows for buffer room, when inflation happens, I can, I can handle it, right? So it's, it's really focusing in on what you can control and, and not and giving up that you can control the things that you can't. Okay, that's really, really important. And so to your question about like, what do we pay attention to? It's certainly the things you can control, pay attention to, and then be aware of maybe the external things like inflation. And I mean, I love, I love money. So like, I'm going to pay attention to what the Fed's saying every time that they go to their meetings. You don't have to do that if you don't like money, if you don't, if you don't really enjoy the substance, right? But reading, reading the news and, and reading objective news and not slanted news in either direction is really important. Getting the facts and the data, and then making your own decisions on topics that really matter to you, I think that's really important too. Yeah, so of, of all those things, you know, that are kind of out there that we can listen to, um, obviously a lot of those things are out of control, but you know, in your opinion, like, are there certain things that maybe we should be paying attention to? Like, should we, should we really understand the inflation rates better? Like, should we, I, you know, I mean, we could go, go, go on and on kind of down the list of things, but are there certain things that like, okay, maybe, yeah, like we should spend a little bit of time, uh, getting educated and kind of watching what's going on. I mean, inflation is, is one that's, it's front and center right now because of the sizable increase in inflation over the past couple of years that is now hopefully coming down a bit. Um, but what you should know about inflation is that it's going to potentially impact your ability to spend. So you don't have to know why inflation is happening necessarily because it's, it's complicated. It's economic. There's a lot of things that go into why inflation is happening. It's not just this or that. Um, 
but being able to say like, all right, there's an expectation that maybe inflation isn't coming down and that costs are going to continue to rise. I am going to have to make a new budget. Right? That's, that's really important. If, if the economy is shifting and there's a potential for a recession, how does this potentially impact my job and my industry? Because in COVID, if you could work from home, you really weren't impacted by COVID, right? Unless you had like some, you know, obviously the, the, the disease, the sickness or the family, but, sure. but your job probably wasn't impacted. But if you were a service person that needed to be in person, you were fired, like you lost your job. So understanding what's going on in, in the economy and how it's going to impact your job and then planning for a potential downside is really important because we don't know what's going to happen. It's the future. We need to pay attention to what we're, what we're concerned about and plan for a worst case scenario in that realm. So like, where do we go from here? You know, like once this episode is, is over, how do we take like an inventory of where, you know, our current money habits are and, and start creating new ones? I know, you know, something you talk about a lot on your website is this idea of investing in, in your future. You know, how do we kind of create like our own action plan going forward so that we are, you know, going in the, in the positive direction? Yeah, I think the, the, one of the key thing is to not get overwhelmed with the whole process. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, like just start with one thing. And I think getting grounded in what your goals are and what they might cost, right? If if, if a goal is like pay for college for my kids, figure out how much that might cost. If your goal is spend more time at home and less time working, well, could you adjust your career in a way that allows you to do that? And, And once you get grounded in those goals, you can start to save for them. And again, if you feel overwhelmed by things, pick one. What's the most important thing right now? What is going to be the biggest impactful thing for you to do from a goals perspective? Save your money towards that goal. And once you start making progress and feel more comfortable, then you can start to branch out. Um, Because I'll say it over and over again, it's the consistency. It's talking together, setting up meetings with your spouse, whether it's monthly or quarterly, to discuss money. And if you find that those are going well, continue with them. If they're not going well because you're arguing, bring in a coach. (laughs) <laughs> right, you you don't need to go it alone. You should fix it if it's broken. What kind of things are you are you talking about in in those sessions when you come to? I call it a money date. You know what what kind of things um, do you talk about when you're either talking about monthly or you're talking about it quarterly? Yeah, I mean, my wife and I do it quarterly based on it aligning with our distributions from our business, um, and we 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 are talking about budgeting. Like, what is what is our next three months look like? We have our normal spending that we do. Are there any big expenses that we need to plan for outside of that normal spending? And are there any expenses in the next six months that are bigger that we have to start to save for now because we know we can't just save for them in a given month? Like if something costs $10,000, I may not be able to save, use my normal cash flow in a month to pay for that thing. So I should save you know, some money over time to get there. And so as long as we're on the same page with what expenses look like. Uh, we can then talk about goals and what what is important to us. Do we feel satisfied right now? And if not, well, what do we need to change? If our, if our job is so frustrating that we are bringing it to the money conversation with our spouse and it doesn't allow us to, to enjoy the conversation and look deeper in, 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 I don't know, just enjoy life in general, then we should change that. And so use that time to go down a rabbit hole and hopefully the, the spouse is, if it's your spouse talking, telling you, just listen, just hear them. It doesn't have to be always structured conversations about budgeting and saving and stuff. That should happen. But whatever comes up is what comes up. And as long as in, in the realm of money and life and just managing your finances wisely, then I think it's okay to have a conversation about it. But just give yourself some time. Don't make it 30 minutes. Make it an hour and a half if it takes that time. Why do I do what I do with money? <laughs> that was one of the best takeaways from Eric. I think that's a great question to ask yourself this summer and just dig around a bit with. Maybe some patterns start to emerge. Like maybe you're like, oh yeah, the way I talk about money is the way my parents do, or that doesn't really serve me anymore, or 
I got some great money values from my sister. I should really lean into those more, etc. You get where I'm going here. If you want to start building good money habits, I, I agree with Eric. It really starts with just looking at your relationship with money, dialing in what works and getting rid of what doesn't work. So just some food for thought this summer. If you want to connect with Eric, you can head to beyondyourhammock.com to get all of the info. You can also check out the podcast he does with his wife, Beyond Finances, where you're listening to this podcast right now. And if you enjoyed this episode, share it with a few friends, a few family members, get everyone in the loop, help everyone to start building some good money habits this summer. You can head to the show notes for all the links to our episode guest, as well as the sponsors who make this show possible. All right. Enjoy your summer. Relax. Don't stress out too much, but come back in a few days for a brand new episode.